Hello and welcome. This is Anne Mullen from Cycle Technologies. Thank you for joining us for a chat about the effectiveness of birth control methods. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to mention for our audience uh, who is joining us live for the webinar that the webinar is being recorded for future viewing. So we will post it on our Cycle Technologies website and our YouTube channel. Also, the audience participants cannot hear each other, and uh, we also cannot hear you. We will be taking questions at the end of the discussion, so if you have a question, please type it into the question box in the webinar panel on the right-hand side of your screen and click Submit. We will also be taking questions via Twitter, so our handle is at CycleTechGlobal, which you can see at the bottom right of the screen. Uh, and you can send questions there during the webinar. And we'll also be tweeting the webinar at hashtag GetSmart. So I'm happy to be joined today by two experts in the field of reproductive health. Uh, Dr. Victoria Jennings is the director of the Institute for Reproductive Health at Georgetown University. Uh, hello, Dr. Jennings. Hello, Anne. Thank you for having me here today. And Dr. Jeffrey Spieler, who is joining us remotely. Dr. Spieler is the recently retired Senior Technical Advisor for Science and Technology in Population and Reproductive Health at the U.S. Agency for International Development. Hello, Dr. Spieler. Hello, and look forward to this webinar. <laughs> yes, thank you both for joining me. I'm so glad to have you here as guests to discuss efficacy of birth control. Um, I did want to say a couple words about the topic. Uh, we chose it for a webinar discussion because we found that a lot of information about birth control effectiveness is available to health professionals and kind of in an academic way, uh, but perhaps it's not so uh, accessible for women using birth control and the reasons for how it is effective and why it is effective and what kinds of things women should take into consideration when they're making their choice about uh, birth control. So our audience today are mostly women who are interested in this topic, but we also have some healthcare professionals uh, joining us too. So to move on, I'd like to talk about our goals then for the webinar. We'd like women to know about the range of methods that are available to them. So we'll uh, go through what is actually available on the market. Secondly, we'd like to clarify about how methods are evaluated uh, for effectiveness and then how they work in real life. And we'll talk about the tested effectiveness of methods. And finally and importantly, we'd like women to know what factors affect effectiveness for individuals. Uh, so here, first of all, we have the basic categories of birth control that are on the market today and have been scientifically tested for effectiveness. So uh, Dr. Jennings and Dr. Spieler, uh, you can make any comment about as I go through these methods. Um, first, I wanted to show here on the upper yes. left what uh, we're calling provider-dependent methods. So this is the IUD implant and so these are ones where women, where you go to your doctor and they either implant or surgically insert or give an injection and then it's taken care of and there's no further action that you have to do. Um, and then we have these three other categories where there's action by the woman. So there's the pill, which of course a lot of people have heard about. I think it's probably one of the most popular methods. And then there's the vaginal ring. Both of these are hormonal methods that uh, stop ovulation. Um, fertility awareness methods are another category. Uh, we have the standard days, two day, symptothermal, and ovulation. Um, they all identify the time when a woman uh, is fertile during her menstrual cycle. And so that helps her to know whether or not she should abstain from sex or use a barrier method, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, to prevent pregnancy. 
And thirdly, the barrier methods, uh, the main ones, the condom, uh, the male condom is a very popular method uh, used by a lot of couples. There's also a female condom. Uh, there's the diaphragm that blocks the uh, entry to the cervix, to the entry to the uterus. And then spermicides, which uh, damage sperm. Uh, they're a chemical um, way to block the sperm. So all of those barrier methods are a block between the sperm and the egg of the woman. So, uh, Dr. Spieler, did you have um, any comment about something I might have missed, or does this look pretty complete? Sure. Well, there, there are other methods that are not on this chart, and, and that's okay. And I think I would like to mention that what, what we have called provider-dependent methods uh -huh. that you explained, you need to go to your provider to have the method uh, inserted or injected. Uh, the, one of the points about those methods is that they are going to work despite the user's behavior. So if an IUD is inserted or an implant is inserted, it's going to work regardless of the, the woman or the man's behavior. Uh, where the other methods are very much more behavior dependent in order for them to achieve the maximum effectiveness that they can achieve. Right, and that's a great point. So, and I think I mentioned the other ones. It does depend on the woman or the couple to take action, um, either you know taking a pill daily or in the the act of sexual intercourse, someone would have to um, put on the condom. Uh, so it would be dependent on the user. So talking about effectiveness and things that affect it. Um, so in regard to the methods that we were just talking about, uh, I mentioned that they'd all been scientifically tested for effectiveness. And so not to get too technical, but there is a difference between efficacy and effectiveness. And it's a little confusing, but Dr. Spieler, could you maybe explain the difference between the two? Sure. Uh, it really is. Uh, uh, there is a lot of confusion uh, amongst non-researchers uh, amongst women and providers about the difference between efficacy and effectiveness. And in fact, there's some confusion even amongst uh, researchers. So uh, for me, efficacy is a measure uh, of the extent to which a treatment, or in our case of our discussion, a contraceptive method, has the ability to bring about the desired or intended effect under ideal or what we call optimal conditions. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is the inherent capacity of the method for having an effect that you want. In the case of contraception, the effect that you want is to prevent unintended pregnancy. And we also call efficacy perfect use rates. So yeah, when I was going to ask the, you about that. I have the what is perfect use. Yeah. So yes, please go on and explain so, what is perfect so use. So perfect use means that the user uses the method correctly and, consistent, and consistently all the time. There's no mistakes made, and we usually get a good idea of perfect use uh, from clinical trials where under the ideal circumstances you can determine whether or not the user of the method actually used the method. And we can then calculate on, for those women uh, who use it correctly, and the number of cycles in which they use it correctly, or the number of months, we can calculate the efficacy or the perfect use rate for a given method. So that would be um, when you're testing the method, it's used the way it was intended every time, and then from there you get a, a rate of efficacy. Is that correct? Right, right, and we call that perfect use perfect. rate. And then I know yeah. there's a second kind right. of effectiveness. So, Right. So what is effectiveness? Effectiveness is also the measure to, uh, of the extent to which a treatment, and in our case a contraceptive, actually achieves the desired or intended effect, which for us is preventing unintended pregnancy, under usual or under real world use. So it's not done in clinical trials under ideal use. So it's a measure of how well the method works in practice when people, mm -hmm. when thousands of people are using it. So it's subject to mistakes and misuse and non-use. And that rate is called the typical use rate, or we call the effect, 
the, the use effectiveness of the method. There is a big difference between perfect use and typical use. And as I said earlier, those, what we call those provider dependent methods like inserting an implant or an IUD, the difference between the perfect use and the typical use rate is very, very small. There's almost no difference. In the case of an IUD, uh, if the woman doesn't realize the IUD has been expelled, then she uh -huh. could have a pregnancy, but people are told to look for the string and so forth. So there's very small difference between perfect use and typical use uh, for those provider-dependent methods. And for the user-dependent methods, there can be a very big difference between perfect use and typical use rates. And it sounds like there could be a big difference. Uh, so you would have an effectiveness <coughs> rate for typical use, but it wouldn't be the same for every woman. Is that right? Well, you know, interesting you, you asked that question because, uh, you know, I sort of have a thesis that, uh, that you might even be able to get better use rates uh, amongst people who are using the method than in clinical trials. And, and why do I say that? Because people in clinical trials have to meet certain criteria. They've got to do their, their medical, they, 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 uh, they have to meet these criteria and they're followed very carefully. And sometimes there are randomized clinical trials where two methods are randomized and the, the woman might not have, was hoping she'd be in the other group. Oh. So she might not be the perfect user. Mm -hmm. Where in, in typical use, you can have a highly motivated user uh, who will follow the rules correctly all the time and hence she can, she can get close to achieving the efficacy or the perfect use rate because she's, she or he is so careful about using the method correctly all the time. Mm -hmm. So it, you get very high rates under real world use. It really depends on the behavior of the user. And yeah, the and that's a good point. And, yeah, and I would like to, when further in our discussion, I would like to bring that up again. Um, but uh, Dr. Jennings, going back to the perfect use, so uh, Dr. Spieler was explaining, you know, how in clinical trials um, they test the method. And even with perfect use, methods do sometimes fail not because the user did something. And why would that happen? Well, as, as Dr. Spieler explained, um, <clears throat> this is a very interesting question, I think. As, as, and as he pointed out, there are some methods, uh, for example, an IUD, um, in which the perfect use and typical use effectiveness, you might say, uh, is quite similar because the, the user doesn't have to do anything. Um, it's just that is the nature of the method, the inherent nature of the method. Uh, while in others there's a, a much, a, there's a bigger gap between the two because of the, because of the amount of user behavior mm -hmm. that is involved in the use of the method. But your question is why do they fail even sometimes when people use them perfectly? And it simply goes back to the inherent nature of the, the method itself. Uh, for example, a, a condom may be used absolutely correctly. Every a woman could use it, could have every single time she has intercourse, she could, uh, there would be a condom. Mm -hmm. But there might be a flaw in some way in the condom. Um, or the condom itself, I mean, just the material that it is made out of suggests that there might be some kind of a of an opportunity for failure having nothing to do with the woman's behavior or her partner's behavior for that matter. So they matter. use it correctly but it could <clears throat> some fail. Correct. Them. Or uh, in the case of fertility awareness methods uh, they could be used absolutely correctly every time um, but the woman may have some biological issues that could affect her the timing of her ovulation, that could affect her her fertility at a certain point. So there can be a, there can certainly be a difference. It, it is it depends upon the inherent the nature of the method itself. Right. And one thing I didn't mention for our audience before is that Dr. Jennings, you've been very involved in this kind of testing as the director of the institute, having developed two methods, the standard use and the method. So. These are things that uh, you work very closely with. That's correct. That's correct. We had a we had a lot of discussions around efficacy and effectiveness and uh, behavior. You can imagine when well, we were uh, developing and testing those methods. Well, and that would bring me then to the, the second question I have for you is: so we had the perfect use, and then what are the reasons that a method, an effective method, 
can sometimes fail in, in typical use? Well, in typical use, um, again, it's, it's a lot easier to explain than it is in, in perfect use. Um, in typical use, what we're really getting at is it has a great deal to do with the, with, with the action of the woman and in some cases also of her partner. Um, there might be, for example, um, a woman might be using, uh, let's say, the birth control pill but her life is just not set up so that she can take that pill at the same time every day. And even with her best intentions, mm -hmm. that doesn't happen. Sometimes she forgets. Sometimes one or another thing might happen. So in that opportunity, that's, that's called typical use. It's her real life. Mm -hmm. And so she becomes pregnant even though she didn't want to and considered herself to be using uh, an effective method of family planning. Um, again, I would go back to fertility awareness methods, the same sort of thing. Um, a woman who is using a fertility awareness method and her, and her partner may um, have unprotected intercourse on a day that's identified as fertile. Um, perhaps they're aware and perhaps they're not aware that that's a fertile day. Uh, but that's real life. That's behavior. So uh, that's, that generally has, has to do with it. There are some other reasons as well that I think we might get to uh, a, a little bit later in the discussion. Right, when we talk about uh, mm -hmm. yeah, personal mm -hmm. reasons for. One question I had with typical use, and something I had heard was that practice makes perfect. So if you're using a method over time, there's effectiveness in the first year, but then you're going into the second year and so on, and people get better at methods. How does that affect uh, efficacy or effectiveness of a method? Well, in general, um, it, you're correct. The, uh, the effectiveness of the method um, for that woman improves over time with use. Uh, there are any number of reasons for that, um, that we, could, we can go into the, some of the biological bases of that for some women, and that might be exactly the case. But a lot of that does come down to behavioral issues once again. Let's say a woman gets used to taking a pill every day. She doesn't forget anymore. It's just become ingrained in her as part of her life. Or she is on such a routine with using um, her injection, her three-month injection, that she absolutely is, has a return visit scheduled to her provider every three months. There's no problem. She doesn't delay getting back or whatever. And again, with the fertility awareness method, she and her partner are now used to this. They have use this method for a long time, it's just become part of their relationship. So those are some of the reasons that effectiveness improves over time. Mm -hmm. has a lot to do with behavior. I mean, it, it sounds logical, um, but sometimes when you're looking at effectiveness, which we will hear, um, you see the rates and you think maybe they're solid, but there are many things that could change, including, it sounds like, um, using a method with practice. Um, now, let's take a look here at the effectiveness of the various methods. And here, as Dr. Spieler, as you explained, there is both the typical use and perfect use shown. And we have them in green for the typical use and orange for perfect use. And just looking across the categories, um, as you've both mentioned, the uh, provider dependent, where you go in and have an, an implant or injection and so on, the rates look very similar. They don't vary too much. Uh, here, the injection, um, you had mentioned Dr. Jennings, uh, there is some discrepancy. You were saying that maybe, maybe a woman forgets to go in for her injection, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. there is a, a difference there. Um, and if you look at the pill, you can see these numbers are still all very high in the, in the 90s, over 90%. The pill, a little bit lower. Again, I think to your point, Dr. Jennings, about forgetting the pill or, or for whatever reason, uh, the same with the ring. And then the behavioral things, too. You can see, again, with um, fertility awareness, somewhat lower. And in the Barry methods, again, typical use, somewhat lower than in perfect use. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out, and I think that the rate for not using a method at all is only about 15 percent. Uh, Dr. Spieler, do you have um, any comment about popular methods um, of birth control that are used most, um, looking at this chart? Yeah, well, I think, uh, I, I think uh, 
uh, we usually compare uh, the effectiveness of methods against use of no method. And, uh, that, and the pregnancy rate uh, of using no method at all varies between about 80 and 85 percent over a 12-month period. And so so all, that's, quite, that's quite a large uh, right. failure. So you'd see, you'd see failure rates, you know, it's a, it's a very, you know, not using a method and not wanting to get uh, and not wanting to have an unintended pregnancy is what we call unmet need. And, uh, and when you compare any method, even the least effective methods to using no method, the, the least effective methods certainly reduce your risk of, of, of pregnancy. And, uh, and I think that one of the things, this table is, is very nice, uh, but what gets lost in the table is the individual because it's aggregate data. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so some people do much worse and some people do much better on typical use rates as we said earlier. And with the pill, you know, the pill is the most popular reversible method in the United States. The actual most used method in the United States is uh, female st is sterilization, male and female. Mm -hmm. But of the reversible methods, the pill is the number one method. And in real use, we, we always say that it's only about 91 or 92 percent effective. And that reason really has to do with not the pill, not that the pill won't prevent ovulation. It's just that if you don't take it correctly, it's not going to work. And most of that failure is forgetting to take the pill, forgetting two days in a row and then not making up for it, not using a backup method if they've missed too many pills before the next cycle starts. Uh, so that's why you see that, that, that discrepancy. Uh, and the same thing with barrier methods. I mean, they, you know, no method works if you don't use it. Right. I think that's and, a point. And I think that um, last year the CDC came out with, uh, the Center for, Centers for Disease Control came out with a report that of unintended pregnancies, 95% of the unintended pregnancies occur to women who are not using a method. So to your point about any of these methods help reduce significantly the chance of an unintended right. pregnancy. But even if you use the method uh, perfectly, there is an inherent failure rate of some methods. And that is going to result in unintended pregnancy despite uh, correct use. And, and that even happens with sterilization over a five to ten year period. There's a pregnancy rate that accompanies it. And, and then uh, and, and, you know, people are disappointed when that happens uh, with a method that they think is going to be flawless. But providers need to tell uh, women and men or their clients uh, what they should expect if they use the method correctly and what they should expect in a general population who uses this method. And reinforce that correct and consistent use will maximize the likelihood that you will not have an unintended pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that's a good point. So even with the most effective methods, uh, nothing is 100 percent. Right. Absolutely. So the kind of the meat of our discussion, too, so it's, I guess, easy to talk about a rate for any particular method, but I do think that personal factors and, um, and consultation are very important. Uh, for choosing a birth control method. So uh, at this point, Dr. Spieler, we've looked at the effectiveness of various methods, and you've explained the difference between, you know, perfect and typical use. And now let's get into a bit more of the personal factors that go into making a choice <coughs> about birth control. Um, could you please talk about some of the other factors a woman might consider uh, when she's deciding on a method? Sure. Uh... It's very interesting that uh, when you interview women, and uh, the, the Guttmacher Institute uh, did a big research study in, in, uh, in South and Central Asia and in, uh, in Africa on uh, women's, why women don't use methods and what they use. Uh -huh. And for many women, uh, the most important thing is that, that the method be effective. And for just as many women, the most important thing is that the method be safe and not have adverse side effects that they can't tolerate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, providers are generally most interested uh, in effectiveness. Uh, they want to make sure that the woman has a, has a very effective method. It's not that they don't care about side effects and, and safety, 
uh, they do care about it, but they're that they're really thinking effectiveness. Women want contraception to prevent unintended pregnancy, and that's the most important thing. But women don't always think the same thing. So there's a lot of women that don't use methods because they are worried about side effects. They have fear of the side effects. They're worried about the safety of the method, uh, and 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 that's a, that's a major consideration. We also know from research that uh, most women don't go to programs and say, tell me about all the methods available here and help me choose the right one for me. The majority of, the women, of women have in their mind what they would like to use. And that's in their mind because they've heard about it, they are, their best friend uses it, their mother uses it, uh, and they say, I'd like to use this method. And then it's the provider's job to make sure that uh, that woman has that method uh, and only dissuade the woman if there's compelling reasons to do so. Because research, research has shown that when women get the method that they want, their continuation rate is a lot longer than when women get the method that the provider wants them to take and they didn't want that method originally. Oh, so that, it's a real good balance between counseling. So, for example, you have been mentioning uh, side effects. If a, if a woman came in and didn't know about all the methods, but perhaps had, I don't know, side effects using the pill, um, what might uh, a provider then say to her? Well, first of all, there's, uh, there's different formulations of pills, and some have different side effect profiles than others. Secondly, we got, we got to see what is the side effect that she's most concerned about. Is it weight gain? Because then you, 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 you would, there are certain methods you would not want her to use. Uh, or is it headache? Or is it, I don't like the, uh, the um, disruption in my bleeding pattern, mm -hmm. which progestin methods cause. I'm not happy with that. Or I'm, I, I no longer get my period anymore, and I don't like that. For instance, that happens, you know, over 60% of women who use injectables after, after the se second treatment, in other words, after six months, they're, they're amenorrheic. They no longer get the period. A very safe condition, but some people are not happy with that. So the, kind of so the providers... Uh, disturbing to some people, probably. Yes, but the provider's job would be to sort of figure out what is the side effect, what is the method they're using, and what other would there be their options that wouldn't have that side effect that the woman is worrying about. And the nice thing about the, uh, what we call the fertility awareness-based methods is that they can be highly effective, as we saw in the chart, on their perfect use rates, and, and they're devoid of any side effects other than the side effect of unintended pregnancy if you don't use it correctly. Right, yeah, that's a, that's a good point there about the something that doesn't have any side effects at all might be something to right. consider. You know, and there's another point that I would like to make and direct, and, uh, direct to one of the questions that you just asked Dr. Spieler, uh, which had to do with what would the provider do if the woman comes in with. And I think that, that there, uh, there is a lot of evidence from research that there are providers who really try very hard to discourage the woman from switching to another method. They really try, they say this method, this method is effective, don't worry about these side effects, they will go away or you will get used to them or whatever. And in some cases that may be true, but I think one of, the, one of the things I would like to say to women is stick up for yourself. If this is a method that you've decided you don't want to use and you're with a provider who's trying to convince you to use it, make your point. Uh, say, well, you know, I think I'm really interested in something else. What else can you offer me? Or I have heard about X method and would like to talk about that. So uh, in the interest of choice and in the interest of respecting what women want, it's very important for providers to take seriously her questions um, and concerns even if the provider believes that they're not all, of, all that important um, or that there aren't serious health effects. And, and, and in most cases there are not serious health concerns with, a, with, any, with any of the methods that we're talking about today. So just, just an extra point that I would like to put in for, for choice and for standing up for yourself. Mm -hmm. Okay, well that, that is a good point. I was going to ask you about you know, counseling, how counseling does uh, affect a, a woman's choice. Um, 
which I think you've given quite a bit of insight on. Well, actually, that. I think there's more there's more to it than that. As Dr. Spieler mentioned, many providers are very, very focused on the effectiveness of a method. That's that you know the woman obviously she's coming in. She wants, she wants to use a method. Why does she want to get a, use a method? Well, because she doesn't want to get pregnant. Well, then let me give you something that is the most possibly most possible effective for, for you. Um, but, but there are other considerations. And um, sometimes the emphasis on effectiveness leads providers to be very biased toward certain methods and against others, uh, which is unfortunate because there's there's a you know, there's a range of methods out there, and women have very different needs uh, over their reproductive lives. Over their um, they they have they have different desires. In some cases, not wanting to get pregnant for a very long time. Um, in other cases, saying, "Well, I'd like not to get pregnant right now, but I think next year would be a good time." Uh, those are those are two very different women. Um, they're they're in very different stages of their lives. It may be the same woman at different points in her life, but but I think the issue is that it's very important to take into account personal factors um, when when deciding what is right for you. And if you're a provider, taking into account the the person, the woman that you're working with right now, and not just focus on the effectiveness of the method. Well, that was uh, something I did want to ask you, which was phases of life. So um, there was something else I had read in the CDC report, which said that a woman switches methods over her lifetime. So by the time she's in her 40s, she may have used five or six, uh, well, three, uh, four, five, or even six different methods. So um, what might cause a switch? What are the, I don't know, Dr. Speaker or Dr. Jennings, where are the maybe milestones in a woman's life where she might consider a different method? Well, I think okay. there, are, there are many. Um, many things can happen. A woman might, for example, have a different partner, and now she's thinking that she'd like to get pregnant in a year or so, whereas before she was thinking she didn't want to get pregnant for the next five years, um, or maybe ever. Um, or a woman might say, you know, I think, and this is a, a sort of a self-perception thing, a woman might say, you know, I, um, I think I'm really not able to get pregnant anymore. Uh, you, you mentioned women up by the age of 40. A woman might say, you know, I'm, I, I know it's, I, I'm really unlikely to get pregnant right now. So, at this point in my life, so I will use a different method. I, 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 or I, I don't have intercourse very often um, anymore, or now at this particular time in my life, or whatever, um, and so it, there, there are all kinds of reasons for switching. Um, a person's life changes and you have different needs in different times in your life. Yeah. Um, so, so lots of different reasons why that could occur. Dr. Spieler sure. probably has some good ideas on that topic as well. Yeah. Well, there is the whole life cycle approach. So in your, your adolescent years, if you're sexually active, you absolutely don't want to get pregnant. and uh, and and, and that would affect what method uh, you're going to use. When you decide that you want to become pregnant uh, or you want to be pregnant in the next couple of years, you don't want to be using a method that will delay your fertility. And we know that injectable contraceptives are highly effective, but they cause a delay in return of fertility. So if you're thinking about getting pregnant next year, then uh, you want to be using a method that's going to have no impact at all on your fertility and if you really don't care if you get pregnant in six months or 12 months, then you, 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 you might not use any method at all to make sure that you're fertile, or you'd use a method like a barrier method, for instance, or a periodic abstinence-based method. Uh, then after your first child is born and you're breastfeeding, and uh, we know that the lactational amenorrhea method, uh, under the right conditions, uh, in those conditions being the child is less than six months old, you're fully or nearly fully breastfeeding and your menses has not returned, the method is 98% effective. But when, those, when that changes or if you're not fully or nearly fully breastfeeding, you want to use a method that's compatible with breastfeeding. So you'd never advise a woman to go on a combined oral contraceptive because we don't give estrogens to breastfeeding women. So that would have their effect. And then after, in the interval between the between weaning the baby and planning the next baby, 
you want to have a method again that's effective but might not have too much effect on your fertility. You certainly wouldn't want a permanent method. Mm -hmm. So as your life changes and as you reach your desired family size and you don't anticipate ever wanting to become pregnant, uh, a lot of women will turn to uh, sterilization or men to vasectomy. Uh, now while you can reverse those, you, they have to be presented as permanent methods because the likelihood of reversal in a take-home baby is, is relatively low. Uh, and, and, and so sterilization is a, a marvelous method because it relieves any fear of, uh, of unintended pregnancy except under very rare circumstances, but it does happen. Uh, and, and, and some people report improved sex life when they're not worried at all about pregnancy. So I think over your life cycle, you, you use methods that are appropriate for the different stages. Uh, and some methods, uh, you don't need to go to sterilization. If, if you don't want any more children, but you think there could be a possibility, well, an IUD will last 12 years. So that can take a woman from her late reproductive years right into menopause without ever having to use, change a method, depending on her age. Uh, so those are, those are the decisions that women should be making in common, you know, by themselves and in discussion with their provider. Yeah, so I think that that's a, a good final statement for us to um, close our discussion. Of course, there's so many more things we could talk about in relationship to choosing a method, but I think what you were saying, a woman knowing what's available and knowing the things that she wants and where she is in her life, and having her health care provider guide her with what's available and a method that will uh, meet her needs uh, at that time. Um, what I would like to do now is invite people to send in any questions. Uh, if you just bear with me one moment, we'll take a look and see uh, what anyone has answered. You, again, you can tweet us at CycleTech Global or you can submit a question in the question box. Uh, one question is, uh, why is there so much debate about the failure rates of fertility awareness-based methods? Um, mm -hmm. One in four seems high. One in four, I think they're saying um, that one in four women must get pregnant using a fertility awareness method. Uh, Dr. Jennings, that's uh, oh. in, in your area, kind of, or oh. your, ex your <laughs> area of expertise. Right. Um, well, may I say that Dr. Spieler is an expert in this area as well, so uh, some, of, some of that I, can, uh, I would gladly let him respond to. But I think partly it depends upon how the studies are done, and it, it, the rates are certainly not one in four for people who are using the methods that have been tested in good clinical trials. In some cases, a, a, a statistic is used that will show, let's say, a, um, a woman, that, that, I'm sorry, that a, that a uh, fer that fertility awareness method sort of lumped all together mm -hmm. um, are, have a, an efficacy rate, people might say, of 70 percent. Well, and that comes in from a, from a very unusual approach, um, I think, to, uh, to looking at, at the efficacy of various uh, contraceptive methods or birth control methods. Um, and, and this is, it comes from a survey, basically, of women uh, asking them what they have done over the past year in terms of, of using contraception and did they get pregnant. So some women who say, oh, I was using a fertility awareness method and I got pregnant, um, that woman may well have not been using any, any of the mm -hmm. methods that, were, that are well defined and that have been tested, uh, but instead she perhaps had heard from someone who had heard from someone else or she read it in a, an online, uh, some kind of an online uh, information site or something like that about when she could get pregnant. And so she's sort of applying that to her life, but maybe not in a regular way. Um, and the information that she's using may or may not be, be t totally accurate, which creates um, a lot of confusion, I think, around, um, around uh, the effectiveness of those methods. Um, also, I think it depends upon uh, some of the populations that methods might be tested in or uh, that sort of thing. There can be all, all kinds of reasons mm -hmm. of that nature. Mm -hmm. um, it requires a, a woman to really understand how to use these methods and be in a situation where, uh, where she can use them effectively. Yeah, I think that is a very uh, 
detailed answer. Uh, let's see. The next question we have, someone wants to know, uh, how can a provider or user decide when it is time to discontinue a provider-dependent method? So I guess that would be the IUD or the implant uh, when the user is, in fact, approaching menopause. Most women are no longer menstruating, and there is an age age specific. Uh, looks like it cuts off there, but um, I'm not sure, uh, Dr. Yeah. Spieler, or? Yeah, well, that's a, it's an interesting question because, uh, you know, menopause doesn't occur at one moment. Mm -hmm. it, you know, menopause is a slow process of cycle lengths changing their length, the, the normal cycle changing. The cycle lengths are what we call curvilinear. At the very beginning of your reproductive life and at the very end of your reproductive life, there's great variation in cycle lengths. And during your mean reproductive years, for the most part, uh, cycle lengths are relatively stable. Uh, so at the end of one's reproductive life, uh, cycles start extending in their length, longer cycles. You start experiencing amenorrhea, absence of bleeding. But you don't know that you've actually reached menopause until you actually have about a year of no bleeding. Mm -hmm. And there are tests that can be done. Uh, they measure follicle-stimulating hormone, for instance, to see if it's sky high. And that would make a good, in, it's a good indication that, that your ovaries are no longer going to produce fertile eggs. Uh, so we sort of encourage people, and for instance, if they're on an IUD and they're happy with it, take it right into menopause with you. The IUD, um, after many years of use, a little additional bleeding that occurs, and a woman can clearly see that she's not bleeding at all anymore. And then after a period of, of uh, six months to a year of no bleed, um, uh, you would then realize that you could have it withdrawn, taken, have the IUD taken out, at no risk of pregnancy. With, uh, with implants, for instance, it's very difficult to uh, make this, that decision because the implants will always cause some uh, change in your menstrual pattern. Uh, well, and from so my understanding, too, the, the implant is only, is it up to three years and IUD can five, be longer? Uh, five years. You know, the uh, uh, Judel implant lasts five years. Oh, okay. Implanon, which is the single rod implant, Do it actually lasts five US? years. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it lasts five years, although it's still labeled for only three years of use. Okay. Uh, so you got a five-year method, and uh, and you know women should continue to use those uh, for as long as they like. And and into menopause, it's you know it's hard to tell. I've gotten many times questions about you know I'm I'm, I'm I've been using injectables for many years, and I'm not getting my period. And how do I know I'm not in menopause? Right. <laughs> because yeah. I'm, I'm I'm an older age. Well, uh, that's a really good question. And. And as I said before, if you're lucky enough to live someplace so that they, you could have some uh, hormone analysis of your urine, you could determine very quickly if you're in menopause. If not, uh, you're better to be using a contraceptive well into, into menopause before you decide that you're no longer at risk because there are women uh, in their late 40s who still could have an unintended pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And again, you, could need the, you need to know the epidemiology of your area. Some women reach menopause a lot younger, and some reach it a lot older. So it's a good yeah, question. I think that's and a good point that a woman shouldn't um, just guess by her age. Right. I, I would like to actually add to that. I think that was a that was a very thorough answer. Um, but I think that's particularly of concern uh, to some women in uh, during the perimenopausal period who may be saying, "Well, you know, I'm not having intercourse as often as I used to, and besides." all that I hear about the difficulties that women have getting pregnant over 40, I'm really sure that I'm just not, I'm not going to get pregnant. So I can have that IUD out or I can stop, you know, whatever. Um, and it's, it's really important because of some of the risks to the woman and uh, well, basically the birth outcome, uh, that it's, it's very important for her to consider awfully carefully. Uh, what she's going to do about avoiding pregnancy uh, until she does reach uh, sort of a certified menopause. Um, it's, it would be a, you know, it could be a, a very difficult life circumstance for her um, and, and for her baby if she didn't. Uh, so it's, it's awfully important to do that. Right. That looks like it. Um, you've addressed the question that another person had submitted, which was, 
would you comment on the concerns of perimenopausal women who is having less frequent intercourse, which oh, uh, you were talking about, okay. yes, and, and were she to become pregnant, be at high risk for pregnancy problems for herself, and would her baby be at high risk for birth defects? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. that you answered right. much mm -hmm. of that. Right. Well, uh, what about uh, the thank birth you. I guess I, I guess I anticipated. <laughs> I guess I anticipated the problem, uh, the question. But yes, I do think it's it's very important, and has as Dr. Spieler has also suggested, for a woman to to consider very carefully uh, the the possibility of carrying her her method with her into into menopause. But we do know, by the way, even without menopause, fertility starts to decline. Uh, in the late 30s and 40s, mm -hmm. uh, so your, 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 the fertility rate uh, is much lower as a woman ages. So that also means the risk of unintended pregnancy is decreased. It happens. So therefore you still need to use effective methods, but as your fertility decreases, the likelihood of unintended pregnancy also decreases. Uh, yet I think uh, unintended pregnancy, you know, uh, there's no option for many women around the world if they have an unintended pregnancy, and um, and therefore, if you at all, if you think you ha uh, have any risk of unintended pregnancy, you really want to be using a method. And some women decide that their intercourse frequency is so low that they don't want to be contracepting all the time, so hence they stop using uh, methods that they need to use all the time to be effective, and they move to barrier methods or fertility awareness methods, or some women uh, say, I'm going to use emergency contraception in the rare instance that I have, uh, uh, have intercourse. Yeah, I think that's a good point, um, reiterating um, our discussion on milestones. So I guess perimenopause is a time to think of it differently. You're not at zero risk, of course, uh, but there's definitely some risk, even if it's lower. Um, right. Now, I don't see any further questions. I want to thank both of my guests, Dr. Jennings and Dr. Spieler. Um, if you had any further questions, you could please, I'm speaking to our audience, please feel free to send us questions at info at cycletechnologies.com. And we will answer your questions. If we can't answer them, we will reach back out to our experts to get your answer. Um, if, did you have any further uh, comments, Dr. Spieler, Dr. Jennings, before we sign off. Um, no, just thank. I would actually like to to address any of the of the providers in the audience um, with the issue about uh, about choice. I think that um, you know there are there are some most providers of family planning services are are quite uh, competent and extremely sensitive to the needs and desires of their of their clients of their patients um, and I think it's it's pr probably the rare one who is who is not but I think it's just so important for providers as well to keep in mind that the probably the best method for the woman is the one that she wants to use um, and it really does need to be to the extent possible her choice, unless there's some medical reason why a method would not work for her. Um, important to think about what it is that she wants and what she will use um, that fits her needs. Okay, thank you, and I think that wraps it up. Again, Dr. Spieler, Dr. Jennings, thank you so much for joining us, and uh, we'll say goodbye now to our audience, and join us for our next webinar. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank Bye -bye. you.